Hey everyone, I'm Julie Gunlock, your host for the 10th episode of the Bespoke Parenting Hour. For those new to the program, this podcast is focused on how parents should custom tailor their parenting style to fit what's best for their families, themselves, and most importantly, their kids. So on the show today, I have, I'm really excited to have Erica Sanzi joining me. Like me, Erica is the mom of three boys. She lives in Rhode Island and she spent a decade as an educator um, and she had kids <laughs> and uh, spent seven years as a stay-at-home mom. Um, she also served as an elected school committee member and she now writes about education and she interviews education stakeholders at Project Forever Free, where she is an editor. Um, and she tries to keep up with her blog, Good school hunting. I really urge all of you to find Erica's writing and um, and her interviews, her live interviews, which are so informative. The greatest thing, I think, I mean, I, there's so many great things about you, Erica, but uh, one of the greatest things is just um, Erica interviews everybody, everybody. She, and she doesn't just interview people who she agrees with or who agree with her. Um, she's heterodox. She looks for all sorts of opinions. She really tries to think these things out thoroughly and shares that with her audience. So she is just a tremendous, uh, sort I would say just fountain of information. I have found so I have, I've learned so much from Erica. So I'm thrilled to have you on today, Erica. Oh, I'm so happy to be here, Julie. Thank you for having me. And I appreciate all those very kind things that you said about me, which I was taking notes so that I can share with my family <laughs> later today. And let them know how, you know, that some people actually say nice things about me. (laughs) Well, I have nothing, but I have nothing but nice things to say about you. It's funny before, um, you know, Eric and I were kind of scheduling this and we were wondering if either one of us will get an interruption during this podcast. And and as I said at the beginning of the interview, if there is an interruption, like if a kid comes in screaming that they want a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or if a dog, you know, starts barking. We're not going to stop the podcast and sort of deal with things. We're just going to roll with it. So, so, um, so here's good, good luck to us both here, Erica, as we try to get through this. Um, so look, the, the reason, the reason I wanted you to come on t- today is, is I think one of the issues that I think you are so, um, passionate about and have spent a lot of time writing about is the issue of boys and how they're faring in America's educational system. And I'll just bottom line this for everyone. They're not doing so well. So you've spent a lot of time talking about that. And I do want to get to that. That is sort of the point of our podcast today. But before we get into that, I, I want to talk about what your situation is. You've got three boys at home, but but what are what is the situation? Are they at home? Is it hybrid? What what kind of what what schools are they in private, charter, public? What what's your situation? So I um have three sons, uh, sixth grade, eighth grade, and 10th grade. And all of them are in a hybrid situation right now. So the oldest goes to parochial high school um, and they do every other day. So he gets three days, one week and two days the next, but then they, um, they live stream whatever's happening in school for the kids that are home. So Ah. the good thing, the good thing about the way they're doing it is you get the same content and instruction whether you are at home or in the classroom. Smart. Um, and that is much better than what is happening for my middle school children who um, they, go, they go, they're in the district, and the district has it set up that Monday is distance learning for everybody. Mm-hmm. And then, oh, my gosh, hold on. i got to let the dogs out already. No worries. Monday is distance, is distance learning for everybody. And then um, you either go Tuesdays and Thursdays or Wednesdays and Fridays. Okay. But on the days that you don't go in, you have what's called independent tasks. So you have no interaction and no instruction those two days. You have, you go into, I think they go into Google Classroom, your assignments are there, and you are expected to complete your assignments. And um, so that's been a big disappointment in the sense that, even though they'll say we expect the independent task days to move kids forward in the content, the reality is my middle schoolers are probably going to get half as much content as my oldest simply because, you know, they're only getting instruction two days a week. And, um, And another important point is that I have received an email in the past week from the superintendent, 
from two teachers, not just to me, but they wrote them to all of their students. Um, and then I watched a video from the high school principal all saying that the turn-in rates and, uh, for oh, yeah. work are really, really concerning them. So what they're oh, yeah. seeing is that on these independent task days, large numbers, they did not give a percentage, they didn't give any sort of like a breakdown other than we are seeing a lot of kids not doing their work. And it was kind of a plea for parents to encourage their kids to, you know, complete their work and turn it in. And while I'm not personally struggling with that with my own kids at the moment, I am incredibly concerned that, um, you know, that that is happening, though not surprised when you're, t when you're asking kids to essentially work independently on their own with no interaction two days a week. Right. right. Yeah, it's tough. And, you know, I have, um, it's funny, you said your oldest was in a parochial school. Is that correct? Yeah. So my oldest is in his, so just a little bit of background so people know, like, I'm not just a heterodox, you know, in my political views, but also in the way that I pick schools. Because yeah. last, last year, for example, I had, um, one in a charter, one in the district, and one in uh, this par parochial high school. All of my kids went to charter school, the same charter school. Um, it, it have, it's a school that actually serves two suburban and two urban districts. So it's what they kind of call like a diverse by design school. Yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, so yeah, so my, my oldest was in our local elementary school, which was, you know, the quote unquote top elementary school. And I can literally hear recess from my house. Oh, that's great. But I just wasn't loving it. And I didn't feel like, I just didn't really feel that satisfied with it. And he was, you know, talking a lot about how he didn't feel like he was really learning anything. Yeah. And, um, and I should say, by the way, that that school has really done, you know, dramatically improved in recent years. But anyway, so they all went to the charter school through fifth grade. Then they've all gone to my district middle school through eighth grade. My oldest is at this parochial high school. And, you know, if things go as planned, my middle one will also go to that same high school next year. Well, that's sort of similar to me. And I've mentioned this before on the show, but I'm doing, I like to say I'm doing this grand experiment because I, my oldest is being homeschooled, fully homeschooled by me. And then um, uh, he's on lunch break right now. <laughs> And then my middle is in a Catholic school, but it's it's totally online. And then my youngest is in um, in the public school, which I don't yep. have. I, and and I will say that um, he's finishing up fifth grade, so he's finishing up elementary school. And he was very very. He had tons of anxiety about leaving it. We I I if anybody follows me on Twitter, you know that I've had a lot of problems with my local school district. And I think they're dishonest. They're completely dishonest with parents. They're keeping um they're keeping schools completely shut down. We have no hybrid options um in this district. And we have a huge uh number of of very poor and um English learning English language learning kids and special needs kids that are have been completely abandoned because it's not like they're bringing back that those demogra those small number of dem you know of kids who are English learning language or special needs. They're not bringing back those kids at all either. So um, it's just com a complete and total shutdown. And um, so you're, wow. So so you guys are so you're in one of those cities, one of those districts. Yep. Where literally no one's been into school. No, no. March. Like what, my children have not entered a school building since March. It's last. You know, like. That spring and it's completely insane and they completely ignore I mean you've got Dr. Fauci at this point <laughs> Mr. Mask Mr. Shutdown saying um saying okay but like schools should be exempt from a little bit of this and he's and Fauci keeps saying like you know hey look it doesn't look like you know schools are the real problems in terms of transmission I mean you literally have the most cautious man in America. God bless him. I'm not like, I'm not one of these people who hates Dr. Fauci. I really, I think, you know, I have sort of mixed feelings. I, I don't agree with everything he says, but you know, when you have Dr. Fauci even saying like, Hey, I don't, and you have New York city. Okay. With governor de Blasio that's opening the schools and Alexandria city doesn't Oh, it's, I cannot, I, it's, it's insanity. The, the, it, so, so I'm in a situation, so this is a, so that's partly why I pulled, I, that's why I pulled my oldest son out. And that's why I pulled my middle son, because I just, I worried, I feel like in, you get to a certain grade, I feel like sixth grade is really important. I think fifth grade math is important. And for instance, my son, who's in fifth grade, who's in, um, who's still in the public school, 
Um, and the element, I will say like an exception, the elementary school he's in, the teachers are trying really hard. And I think it's not as bad. It's, it's the upper grades that are getting really bad, at, at least in my, this is only my opinion in my local town, but I, but I hired him a math tutor because he was failing. He was really falling behind in math. So, um, so anyway, but the point is like, no, no child in this town has been, has been in a school since March and it's complete insanity. Um, and so I have a lot of problems, but again, my, you know, I think as a parent, what you try to do in these situation is figure out like, you know, you also don't want your child to have tremendous anxiety. And I think the shutdowns coupled with, at least for my youngest, the shutdown coupled with the idea of going to a whole new school was just really hard for him. So we kept him in the public school. So again, as I've said, I'm, I'm doing this grand experiment because I'm, I literally am doing homeschooling, private school and public school all in the same year. So very similar to you. And I guess that also makes me kind of heterodox in terms of, like you say, in terms of education, which is, I like that. I like that, that, that title. So, um, your situation, and, though, well, I can't say, and, go, go, go on. No, I was just going to say that part of the reason is because I don't have an allegiance to any particular yeah. school model or any particular, right. you know, version of school governance. So it's not that I, I don't play on any of these teams right. where I think one is better than the other. Yeah. I just think that common sense tells me that children need different things and that the right fit. I mean, we see um, within families often that the school that's the best fit for one child is not the best fit exactly. for another child. Yeah. And, that, and that's the children coming from the same house. Right. So, yeah, so it's not. And, and, and part of what makes these education conversations incredibly frustrating and honestly, they get boring after a while is because the tribes that only cheerlead for one kind of school, right. are they're all wrong because the only thing that makes sense is to be agnostic about school exactly. models yes. and then want the best for every child whether it's, you know, whether it's my own children that I'm talking about or, or, or any other mother out there because I'm, or father, I should say, because I'm, I'm saying to myself, you know, I just want every kid to be in a school that's the best fit for them and where they have the best chance of, to quote uh, a good friend of mine, Darrell Bradford, he always talks about and of themselves. And that's yeah. how I think of it, right? Like I want kids in the place where they have the best chance of becoming the best version of themselves. Yeah. And if yeah. it's a massive, if it's a massive comprehensive public high school, that's great. And if it's a really small specialized school, that's great. And if it's public or if it's private, I don't care. Well, you know, the, I, I, you know, I, I start off this program. Every time I start off this program, I say that this podcast is focused on how, how parents should custom tailor their parenting style to fit what's best for their families themselves and most importantly, their kids. It's a little tagline I, I say. I say it at the beginning of every single – and that's the point of bespoke. It's tailor-made. Bespoke clothing is tailor-made. So that is such a great – I'm so glad to hear you say it because it fits in perfectly with my podcast. Thank you very much. But – it, but it's it's the way I also view things. Um, I, 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 you know, I, 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 it's funny that you say because sometimes I do find myself being a little bit on a team. But what I'm really, but what I really want is choice. And yep. I really, really want what's best for every child. And what this, what this year has taught me, it's exactly what you say about you can have I we my husband and I joke that we can't believe these my our three boys are brothers they're so different they are so different and they share a lot of things in common but they're very different personalities and it's interesting how the homeschooling has really been good for my oldest son but I don't think it would work out for the other so anyway so I'm living what you're saying and that <laughs> is um it's just great it's just great to hear um but I but I do feel like for you know I think I think one thing is that we're we're lucky that we sort of have choices, you know, Absolutely. and, and we can make those choices on our own. Um, but we know that many people can't. And so one of the things that you've written about a lot is, you know, the condition of, um, you know, of, you know, and, and I say this because, you know, I, I, I do think a little bit of this, um, why my son was not doing well in the public school system is because he was a boy. Okay. And I don't mean to, you know, I'm not gonna say, Oh, it was a sexist system or something like that. It just, it wasn't a system that was really designed for him. Okay. And what I, what I, what I, the system that I've set up at home with him um, and, and me being his teacher has, has been really a miracle. It's amazing to me how much he has thrived. He has, he has gotten through the curriculum so quickly. I've had to now buy, 
I've had to buy parts of the next year's curriculum because he has gone through this so fast and he enjoys it so much and he's done so well. And this was, I mean, I can't just, I mean, I could do a whole, I could do 15 podcasts on how my son has changed over the last three months. Um, but a lot of people don't have the opportunities that I have to make that decision. I luckily I work at home. I have a flexible job so I can, I can kind of wedge this in. It's not easy, but I can wedge this in. So, you know, I want to talk to you a little bit about your work on, um, you know, the condition of boys in the public schools. Um, and maybe that's, I mean, I shouldn't say the public schools. I, I don't, I don't know if your writing is just centered on public schools or if the data itself is centered just on public schools. But from what I've read, and I've done much less work on this, I've done almost no work on this, but I've read everything you've done. They're not doing well. Um, can you give us sort of an overview of, of, of what that situation is? Yeah. So the reason that I've done um, so much work on this and I'm so interested in it, it's easy, I think, to say, oh, well, she's a mom of three boys. And so, you know, she's worried about her own kids. It's not really that uh, because I'm not particularly worried, even though I, I do have concerns about large issues and, you know, it's sort of in the larger society and culture around what I consider to be almost like a vilification of being male. Yeah. Um, I felt I fell into this because a lot of my work is about looking at student outcomes. Because again, student outcomes sort of drive me. It drives why I believe so much in parent choice and you know parents having options. But what I discovered was we now live in a time where we are almost obsessed about talking about disparities and equity. Mm -hmm. But there is like a glaring and deliberate decision that has been made somewhere, somehow, to ignore one of the most consistent and glaring disparities, which is to say, you will read all the time about the disparities around race, and they are consistent, and they are very big, particularly around, um, you know, like math and reading outcomes, and particularly around discipline statistics like suspension. You will also always notice that they will talk about disparities around income. So you'll, they'll compare um, children from low-income households to children who are not from low-income households, and again, the disparity is consistent and it is very big. Sometimes they'll talk about disparities between students with disabilities and students who don't have disabilities, and those are massive. Yeah. But they don't, in almost every case, they do not mention the disparities between boys and girls. Yeah. And that disparity is equally important, equally massive, and equally consistent. So, so for some, it, it's almost like, it's almost like you know that like the crowd wants to hear about racial disparities income disparities and special education disparities, but they don't want to hear about the gender disparity because it doesn't point in the direction that they want it to point in, that they lie and claim it points in, or that they've been conditioned to think it must point in. Well, you wrote a great piece about this, and I just want to read a little excerpt because it gives a little bit of a history, because uh, I think, I, I truly think some people don't even know about this. I Oh, I, I think most people right, most don't. Right, most people don't. So, so, so it's, you said, this is, this is your, from your piece. It says, there was a time decades ago when girls trailed boys in math and science, and we as a nation deemed it to be unacceptable, starting in the 1970s. I mean, and I have to say, just I'm stopping right there, because when you wrote starting in the 1970s, I didn't even realize it went back that far. But you, you wrote, starting in the 1970s, initiatives and organizations sprung up all over the place to help girls catch up, and they did. But as girls began improving in math and science, boys were on a decline that people either ignored or worse, scoffed at it just being the, as it being the just desserts for those who had unfairly benefited from the patriarchy. Um, so I found that kind of interesting because I, again, I didn't know it went back that far, but as you say, you do have some people, you know, you're talking about how they're not willing to listen to the disparities between boys and girls. And part of it is what you just wrote. 
well, that's what you get, right? For so many years. Oh, 100%. Because 100%, because it used to be that we talked about equality, right? And so you people were fighting hard because right. they wanted girls and women to have the same rights and the same opportunities. But somewhere along the line, it shifted because right. equality is no longer the goal. Because what we're seeing instead is the cheerleading yes. of, 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 of female ascendancy and the cheerleading of decline among their brothers. Yes. Now, I, one really one really important point about this, by the way, is that when I speak to people about this, the reason that they um, feel so strongly about this being a crisis, like they'll call it a boy, the boy crisis, yeah, is because boys are trailing their sisters significantly across every single demographic. So. It is, of course, it is true, for example, that black boys are doing far worse than white boys, generally yeah. speaking. Yeah. It is also true, however, that in, within every category, the sisters are leaving their brothers in the dust. Yeah. And so usually what will happen is they'll say, we have a crisis across the board. And then they'll say, so, you know, it could be a, it's like a three alarm fire. And then they'll talk about how, and then when you look at black boys, it's a five alarm fire. Right. right. But, but, but we can't only talk about this based on, you know, income level and race because it cuts across every single demographic. Yeah. And, you know, that is, which means, by the way, that's, that, that, that's kids growing up in the same house, attending the same schools with the same curriculum and the same teachers. Yeah and having vastly different outcomes. You know, it's interesting. I see sometimes these, you know, I'll see little girls with a t-shirt that says the future is female. I'll see women, women, grown women oh. walking around the future is female. And I'm like, okay, how am I supposed to, like, how am I supposed to react to that as the mom of a boy, right? And how are boys supposed to react to that? Like the future shouldn't be any gender, okay? Or any sex. It, it is, the future is the future. And that's really insulting when you suggest one sex over another is going to rule. That's weird. That's just, I don't, I don't understand. I, I mean, I get it. It's a flip kind of, you know, I don't think most people really mean like, you know, down with men, but I find this, I find it gross and I don't like the acceptance of that kind of thinking. I, you know, I, it's just, it, it is gross. I mean, I don't, you know, pe people can keep saying, oh, please lighten up. It's just a joke. Yeah. Okay, really? Yeah. If it's just a joke, would you be okay? Would you be okay with all the boys in school wearing um, t-shirts that said the future is male? Yeah, of course not. If and it's, it's just a joke. Yeah. It's always, it's so always it's, it's, that, that certain and, jokes are okay. And it, the, it doesn't land on the ears of young boys in a way that makes any sense because. I know, yeah. Like, like my son, like for my son, he's like the principal of the school of their school has always been a woman. And then, you know, the, the woman who operated on him was, a, I mean, I'm sorry, the doctor who operated on him was a woman. So like yeah. his view of the world being born, you know, I'm thinking of my youngest in 2008, he sees women doing all of these things right. that are like you know, having achieved great things and being in all these positions of leadership and, you know, making all these important decisions. Yeah. So it's actually kind of, actually, you know, my kids have been pretty well shielded from a lot of this. I don't live in a, dis in a place where, you know, schools have gone bananas yet with this stuff. Oh or not. Don't, move, don't move here. Yeah. So, <laughs> no. So, I mean, ha do my children, have my children always believe that the way the world is set up is just that only boys get in trouble in school? Oh. Yes. That's oh, yeah. kind of oh, what they think, oh, yeah. but, but, but they're not, they haven't yet been subjected to like where someone is literally telling them <laughs> right. ugly things about themselves for being male. And okay. I know that there are a lot of kids out there that are hearing those messages, but, yeah. Yeah. but the yeah. future is female. My youngest did come across that saying recently, like in the past month. And he literally went, what? Yeah. Because. Yeah. To him, he was thinking, what on earth are you saying? And I'm trying to imagine, I mean, that message. And the, and the thing I don't understand and I would like to better understand is when I hear mothers 
of little boys oh. talking like that, oh, yeah. saying those things, holding up those signs, wearing those T-shirts. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't understand what message you're trying to send. Like, like, like you probably know the well, quote and, you know, you, 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 it, it's like, if, again, if it's about equality, you know, it's not about nine men on the Supreme Court. Okay, now we need nine women on the Supreme Court. To me, it's about having a mix. Like, the whole point was for there to be a mix. So if having nine men was wrong, why in the world would your goal be to shift the pendulum so far that now you have all women? It, it, to yeah. me, all, all you're doing is creating a different but parallel problem. Well, and let's let's not forget, though, there's also a push for, you know, um, I think it's, I mean, I, I, to, to really feminize boys and to yes, make them sort of ashamed of very natural boyish behavior and whether that's, you know, sort of an inability to sit still or be super dutiful in the classroom or, um, you know, rough and tumble play, you know, I am so glad that the years are behind me of going to the playground and you've got the mom who refuses to allow her child to turn a stick into a sword or a stick yep. into a gun or play, you know, whatever aggressive game or the mom who flips out if there's any kind of touch or wrestling or for God's sake, you know, a tackle in a field of grass. Right. So I but because because I will tell you, I I grew up in a rural area in Illinois, farm country, tough people. And I have now raised children in, in a, in an area of hovering helicopter parents, nervous parents who, who really do, who's, who, you know, a lot of the women would agree with the, the future as female. So I have, I have really struggled as sort of the opposite of that. And my boys have all always, and they're three boys. And I think that's probably part of it. Just there's always been rough and tumble. There's always been aggressive game playing every night after dinner. My kids go out. We, (laughs) we, we call it the non poop part of the yard. We have a dog and there's, we have actually, we actually have like a a very big yard and half of it is fenced off and half of it is now not fenced off. And so they go into the, non fenced off portion where the dog is not allowed and they they play tackle games they basically like chase each other and tackle each other and it's great fun for them they come in they're sweating but if they ever tried to play that on the playground years ago it would have been very difficult for me i would have been talked to i'm sure someone would have gone. not every not every mom is like that but i struggled with no that you you and i you and i would have been good pals to play yes around. exactly and and, and p- part of it is that um that when you, that when it's multiple boys, like sort of the that chaos and physicality yeah. sort of grows exponentially yes. as you add more to the mix. And so, like if there's one thing that like you know moms of boys of the generation older than me have always, I mean they'll still tell me now. I, I one mom I grew up with her kids, she had two sets of twins, so four boys, and she talks about how like to this day she's like they can't even walk by each other without you know poking punching, you know, yeah. elbowing. So um, the way that one mom put it, um, she's a mom in Tennessee and she has three sons. And she said um, that the that in some ways it's like her, the feeling is that the school is sending a message without meaning to that this place is not for you. Yes. To, to young boys. And, she, and it's partly because typical developmentally appropriate boy behavior is considered a problem yeah. in as soon as they start school. So they're not only getting, you know, they get no affirmation because they're scolded for what is just sort of normal fidgeting and movement and wanting to sort of touch things. Um, but also they, they're not allowed that adventurous play that used to be allowed yeah. and that you're describing um, you know, and then, and then as they get older, it just becomes like, you know, now the books are uninteresting to them and yeah. now they're expected to read, you know, 
they're, they're like, how many books can I read about a girl and all her emotional problems? And it's a really, <laughs> and it's really a fair question. I'm laughing, but oh my God. I mean, some of the because books it's, that are assigned today are just, oh, like it's so, it's so true too. It's yeah. like, you know, we, all we hear about is, you know, we want kids to be able to relate to the books. You want the books to be culturally, re- culturally relevant. And then in the next breath, you're like asking adolescent males to read things that are so incredibly uninteresting to them yeah. and not just read one or two, because I have no problem. You know, of course you need to read something that's not interesting to you and that's hard for you. Like deal with it. But after a while, it is a little bit like, okay, really? Like how many emotional journeys of females did they have yeah. to go on? Right, right. Right. You know, and, there, as and, and also, by- also it, it, it is, it does sort of, um, it, it is frustrating too, because there is literature, young adult literature that would be interesting to all kids. You don't have to choose these like very, oh, you know, like Lassie, Easily. Lassie. Okay. That is, I'm, I'm just going through the books that I'm right now. My, my kids are reading or Robin Hood. I mean, the, 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 the love story in Robin Hood. It, I mean, my, even my son, oh, that he'll kill me for saying this publicly, but he's 13 and he got to the end. He was crying because it's so, it's such a lovely story, but it's also adventurous. So there's something for both, you know, for both groups. And you know, you're going to, and I actually, I, I do have a follow-up question because I got an interesting tweet. Um, uh, Michelle Munns, who is the, is, uh, let me just look at her Twitter bio here. She's a reporter for the St. Louis, she's a health reporter for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. And I had, you know, I, on Twitter, you, you responded to this. I had put on that, um, I'm going to be talking to Erica today um, about, you know, boys and schools. And she, and I had linked to your piece and she wrote question. What does it mean when you say boys do not need to be like, uh, to quote, be more like girls. And then I said, great question. I'll ask her. And she followed up as a mom of three girls. I would like to know this statement comes from a cultural assumption of how girls are supposed to be, which is not what you said. But, uh, I I wonder if you have a response to that. First of all, what does it mean uh, that boys do not need to be more like girls? I think we've already covered it. it, it, It's obviously based on, you know, averages and generalizations. So sure. there are always going to be exceptions to the rule. Right. But generally speaking, girls um, are more verbal and reading and writing comes more easily to them, especially okay. in at a very young age. Yes. So it is usually much easier for girls at the age of kindergarten to come in, sit still, do as they're told yes, and achieve academically, you know, learning in that way. Right. So for example, um, one of the ways that you get boys much more engaged in school is if they can move around, if they can be hands on, if there is some sort of competition built in, And it doesn't have to be competition with one another. It can be competition with oneself, but some sort of competition. And it's not to say that girls don't also care about competition. It's not to say that girls uh, don't also, you know, like to move around. The difference is that the level of need for that and the impact it has on their academic outcomes. Yeah, yeah. And I... Um, and I, I so, have- so that's one of it, but, but I can add a lot more. I mean, there are a lot of different reasons. Like, for example, I'll give you a personal anecdote example. Um, girls and women, generally speaking, often like to rehash things and talk things out and then keep talking about it. And then, you know, oh, my God, can you believe this? And then talk about it again, right? So we right. like to what, do what's called, we, do, we like to do what's called problem talk. Yeah. We want to we wanna kind of like, you know, the scandal of, I don't know, you know, the, 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 the kid who quit the baseball team the, the night of the championship, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, we, we want to talk about it from every single angle. Right. And boys don't really like problem talk for right. the most part. Right. Um, they, because they don't see a point in it. Right. So when we try to force, and this is what I was talking about, about making boys more like girls, there's pressure on boys lots of times you know, we want you to talk more about your feelings. Yep. We want you to talk more about what happened. And it's not that they don't want to do it because they're like emotionally stunted. 
Right. They don't want to do it because they don't see the point. Right, right. And right. so that is an example. And this happens in marriages all the time, right? Where like right. the wife just wants to vent. And the, and the husband is like, well, is there a problem to solve here? Because if you don't want oh, me yeah. to give you a solution, what's the point of that? Right. What's the point of talking? Right? Yes, exactly. Or, and, or, or, when your husband, you or, or when your husband goes directly to the solution without wanting to talk a little bit about what the problem is. Um, well, no, like I can remember years ago, my husband would say, well, if you just want me to sit here like a rock and, for, and, and serve absolutely no purpose, like just let me know. Like he couldn't think, see the I point but I, but and I, me just wanting to get it out. And my oldest son recently, I was like, I was like, I can't believe you don't want to talk about this. And he was like, mom, there's nothing to talk about. Like it happened. It's over. Like he has no interest. And, yes. and basically what I was essentially doing, I was kind of asking him to gossip. And yeah. generally speaking, <laughs> right, generally yeah. speaking, like males just don't get as much out of that. So so if you're going to pressure, you know, you want them to sit still, you want them to, you know, you know, lo love this book, you want them to not want, you know, you want to convince them that they don't need to be competitive. You want to, you know, try to like, like, for example, they often like things that involve risk. You know, right. I don't mean risk, like going to the top of a skyscraper and, you know, dangling themselves down, but, you know, like calculated risk. Lenore Skenazy talks about this a lot. Yeah. And yeah. we've taken, you know, so we take the risk away and we take the competition away and we push them to talk more about things that they don't see any point in talking about. You know, we question why they won't cry more in public. Right. And it becomes like all of these pressures that do seem like an attempt to, to, it almost seems like what, 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 what the culture is saying, we've decided that the that boys are kind of just defective girls we've we've decided we could, we've decided that the future is female is what we've decided is essentially yeah, what and if you lot, could just yeah. be more if you could just be more you know like you'd be less toxic if you could just be more like a girl and and there are this is a spectrum obviously you know like i think back to you know, I went to school with some girls that were like incredibly competitive. They were such, I mean, they, they also happened to be like star athletes Yeah. They, they, and they were, and they were like total tomboys. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So they wouldn't have fit into a lot of these categories except for the fact that it didn't, they didn't have the same like struggles academically because they were more like that. And for a lot of kids, it is literally like school does not feel like a place. It's almost like they're the square peg trying to fit into the round hole yeah. when they go to school, starting in kindergarten. And I mean, I've talked to so many, you know, educators that have been in working in education for decades, and they will say this till they're blue in the face. I mean, they, they watch it happening before their eyes. Yeah. Um, but I think, and it's too, only, I think, I think and it's question. only gotten worse. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, but I was going to say, I think this question, like, what does it mean when you say boys do not need to be more like girls? And then she says, you know, this is some cultural assumption of how girls are supposed to be, is all part of this current trend of pretending that there's no differences between boys and girls. And, Correct. But, and, right. and, and we're, and we're and I'm I talking suspect, about innate, and innate. We're talking about innate, innate difference. We're talking about. And we're talking about innate differences that are the norm, admitting, of course, that there are exceptions. Yes, of course there are exceptions. But I don't think that some people are willing to even admit any difference. Like that it's insulting to even have the conversation is what I'm saying. That some people, I think, would would suggest anytime you say something like boys are more wiggly and boys want to more competition or tend to be more competitive or whatever, you know, like boys talk shoulder to shoulder, not face to face. Girls talk face to face. Boys like much rather be on a field, you know, and look, and I, I, I you know, <laughs> I have three boys. I grew up with sisters. I, I get it. My, I'm basing this on my own experience. That's an anecdote. That's not necessarily evidence, but I suspect most people can see that boys and girls are different, but I do think that there is a part 
there are people in this country who just find even the concept of that to be outrageous. And in some cases, it's you shouldn't say that. Um, and that, I think, is sort of the root of some of what the problem is here. Um, and I think that you have an education system that feels nervous about recognizing those those differences. But that same education system is okay with, right. you know, di- diagnoses of ADD that are, that are, you know, so much greater for boys than girls and with yes. medicating. I mean, when you talk about, the, if, if you look at the number, and I'd have to pull it up because I don't have it, I don't have it off the top of my head, but I want to say it's five times, but I'm not positive. I, I think you're right. The boys, we are, we are, we're okay. I mean, we're, we're talking about equality and, and fairness and justice, and then we're okay that five times more boys than girls are, are being put on medication. Well, it's just not that. So I mean, that they you, can... These are your numbers. These are your numbers from your articles. Boys are more than, if you're not, if you're going to pretend that there's no differences between boys and girls, then explain this. Boys are more than twice as likely, and again, this is your writing, uh, more than twice as likely to get suspended from school and almost three times as likely to get expelled. Boys represent two thirds of the special education population. Almost 80% of these boys are black and Hispanic. 60% of high school dropouts are male. 93% of prison inmates are male. 68% of them do not have high school diplomas. 85% of juvenile offenders are functionally illiterate. 70% of inmates in Americans' prisons, which again are mostly male, cannot read above the fourth grade level. So, I mean, if you're going to tell me that there's like no differences, but yet in terms of like what boys are going through, the high rates of incarceration, the high rates of illiteracy, the high rates of ADD, the high rates of ADHD, the high rates of detention, and that, as we say, like the pipeline from school to jail, this is, I mean, there, we, you know, we can't deny that there's something going on. And and so I agree with you. I think it's interesting how, you know, schools are willing to see these differences when it comes to things like medicating kids. But, you know, they're ignoring tr- truly, I mean, the suffering of boys in the system. Um, right. I mean, it, it, it's going to have to reach a critical mass where... I mean, I, I read a piece the other day, and it was, the, and the premise, it, w- what was clear to me is that they had decided that the, they had reached their conclusion first, and then they were going to figure out a way to, like, make it work yeah. by finding evidence. Yeah. And so, and it was all about how much bias girls face in schools. And right. they, um, they came up with dress code as the reason that, you know, schools are biased against girls. And I think, and it's, it is true, dress, when it comes to dress code and, you know, how we treat students around dress code and infractions, et cetera, there is no question that it becomes a much bigger problem for girls um, for all sorts of reasons. Right. One of which being that, like, you know, you're measuring somebody's skirt based on their fingertips, but they're tall, they have long arms. Like, it's just, it's, right. it's, so I, that's true. But I was like, but I don't know how you would ignore expulsions and suspensions and, I mean, reading scores since the 1940s. We've seen these large gaps between girls and boys in reading and writing. And so, and it's not like it's getting better. You know, it's getting worse. I mean, if you even look at, I mean, just the, 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 the number of students taking AP classes and in honors classes and earning advanced degrees. I mean, females earn more associates, bachelors, masters, and doctorates. Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You know, they serve in much larger numbers in student government. Yep. Parents yep. of boys and girls will go to these awards nights and they'll joke and say, oh, you know, we're going to the girls' awards night again because yeah. it's like the girls are sweeping the awards. Now, I haven't had that experience personally. So, again, I'm, th- this is sort of like looking at data and testimony from actual parents, many of whom have daughters and sons. Right. I, so you know, I can you, totally you understand. Admit, you had sent me this article or uh, this new report from the Brookings Institute. You know, you have a lot of liberals out there saying, oh, you know, got to you know, gotta worry about the girls, got to continue to worry about the girls. But – this report said that that um, and, and this is from their report. They said that you know liberals say they are more concerned about girls in general, but then when you ask them about their own sons, um, they're worried about their sons. 
Um, so I do find yeah, it kind right. of interesting so, privately how they might admit there's a problem publicly. They might say, Oh, we still got to worry about girls. Right. So the self-described conservatives say that they're more worried about boys in society. And when asked about their own family, they say they're more concerned about their sons. Self-described liberals say that they're more concerned about girls in the larger society, but in their own family, they're more concerned about their sons. And that to me is an absolute in-group out-group phenomenon, right? Yeah. Like I, the, my group, my, you know, m- you know, maybe it's my college professors, maybe it's what my parents told me, maybe it's everything I read now, you know, maybe it's my in-group, but like, I have to be more worried about girls in the larger society because because we live in a patriarchy and, you know, it has to be this way. Right. And, but then they of course look at their own children who they love more than anything in the world. Yep. And when they're being honest about who they're most concerned about, it is disproportionately their sons. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and the thing I don't, the thing I don't understand about this either is like as cliche as it is that, you know, we say, you know, the rising tide lifts all boats, but it, it, it is really true in this case. You do not have to you know, you, no one is calling to slow down the ascendancy right. of girls. Right. Nobody is not, you know, celebrating the ascendancy of girls. All we're saying is that there is no reason to believe that in order for girls to continue on that ascendancy, that boys have to be, you know, on a Le- decline and, and, yeah. and in, and in free fall. I mean, but I, but I would also know, say they, they are, they are left out. Boys are left out. I constantly, I wanted to get my son into, involved in, I, I'm kind of embarrassed to admit this because it's like so trendy for everyone to get their kids involved in coding. But I thought he would enjoy it because he loves computers and he, and, he, and he likes video games. So I thought, let me try to make this more constructive. And all I could find were girl code groups, girl coding groups, girl coding classes. Yep. It was impossible. I finally found some group that has just general classes. But there were multiple choices for girls and my son was excluded. So you're right about this. Like no one says we have to slow the ascendancy of girls, but we don't have to leave out boys. This is kind of, it's stupid now. Okay. It's stupid to do this now to have all this girl centered stuff in science and STEM and stuff like that and, and exclude boys. I find it galling at this point that we're still doing this. I mean, Ivanka Trump, you know, I remember when they, it was like three years ago, she started this like, you know, girl STEM thing. And I was just, I just rolled my eyes. Like, come on, can we just have kids STEM? Like, can we get everyone interested? Um, Melinda Gates is doing something similar too. And if it was worldwide, it would make sense to me because there are a lot of places in the world where girls, you right. know, they don't have right. basic freedoms. Right. But in the United States, not only sure. do we all do do we share the same exact rights as the men, but the opportunities are endless, and the data just tells us that it's like I don't understand the investment in the United States in, into more of this like girl 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 stuff just in looking across the board, like at the, at, at the data in at terms of data. employment, yeah. in terms of higher education. I mean, suicide rates, my God, men are almost at three point, I think it's 3.74 something. It's, it's between three and four times as likely to commit suicide than women. Yeah. And, and, I, and, I, and, I, and yeah. I try to imagine to myself, if that was flipped, wouldn't <sighs> we hear about that all the time? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, on the job death, 93% of on-the-job deaths happen to men. Well, it, it frustrates like, me, too, because that's all part of this this narrative, too, that, you know, um, men don't do anything, like, uh, especially, like, domestically or, or, or you know, you know, men, you know, they're in terms of like the wage gap, but it, it, it's like, oh, there's this massive wage gap and it's only to blame for the patriarchy. But then when you really look at the data, and again, I don't mean to go down this, 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 this different subject uh, area. But, you know, when you look at the data, I mean, good grief, men, men do so much more dangerous work for which they are paid higher amounts. They do more overtime. They work more hours. They stay longer. I mean, there's so many data points that show that, you know, especially, and I, I would say, especially on the, the danger side that, that, you know, they are doing very, you know, 
work that can literally kill them. Um, you know, and, and also, you know, this whole narrative of the men do nothing around the around the house. Well, let me tell you, like the Wi-Fi goes out. I, I don't I don't know what to do. OK, like the gutters. If there's a big rainstorm, my husband is on a ladder. OK, in the gutters. There's a lot of like domestic things <laughs> that, OK, like, I mean, I don't do anything gross. OK, if there's a spider, like, I'm not saying that's a major, you know, like domestic chore to kill a spider. But I'm saying that I, I don't like this narrative. I don't like commercials that always show the wife as the sensible one and always show the husband as the moron, right? I don't like this. I don't like this, uh, this, um, this, this cultural trend of showing men as stupid. And I think it does get to boys. I think they see it, um, whether it's at school, whether it's in, in culture, whether it's on television, whatever. Um, but it is a problem. And there is, there's far, there's far too little appreciation, I think, for, for what men do. So I, um, I also, yeah. And I, it's also just, it's just unhealthy to be again in this weird, like us versus them yeah, yeah. paradigm. Like I'm thinking back to when, you know, Elizabeth Warren was still running for president and she said something about, you know, well, well, you know that when there's a big mess, it takes a woman to clean it up. Oh, please. Yeah. It, and I'm thinking about that, and I said to myself, you know, if my boys thought of, like, a big mess, it, it would basically, they would think that their parents would, would clean it up together based on their skill sets, right? right. So, like, yeah. there's just certain things that each of us are better at, and yeah. that the way that we would manage to solve that problem or fix that mess would break down along those lines. And again, but the I, idea, I mean, and, and honestly, like most, like, like I obviously, I, I am a freaking rock star when it comes to kids throwing up. So like, I will, I will claim credit <laughs> that like, I, I am, a, I have, yeah, I am like I a deep sleeper and I don't generally like shoot out of bed for any reason at all, except if one of my kids like stands at the side of my bed and is about to throw up, I shoot out of bed like a freaking missile. <laughs> And, like, I am really good at that, right? All right, all right. But lots of, like, big, like, lots of stuff that happens around here, like, not only am I maybe not the best one to deal with it, but I, I don't sometimes even realize. the one who, ca- I caused the, like, sometimes <laughs> the mess is because of me, you know? Like, like the reason we have a mess is because mom's literally set pizza boxes on fire because she right, forgot yeah. they were in the oven. Right. Oh, okay. So, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, it, I just, I don't like it because I really do feel like we are a, we are supposed to be working together and like rowing in the same direction. And I don't see how that happens when there's like this concerted effort to really diminish 50% of the population. Yeah. Um, And when you say things like the future is female and you publish op-eds, you know, by, by Megan Rapino, the soccer player talking about maybe it would just be better if men just disappeared for a few hundred yeah, years. So I get, I get it. Like, they're, Oh, we're not really serious. But like over time, those messages that, you know, they don't have no impact. Right. Right. They- and, and yeah, it's just, I, you know, it's just, and, also, uh, you know, and let's say, let's say, you know, you know, because I, I can, I, it does concern me what my boys hear, but let, let's also concern the impact on girls. Like, you know, what does that give them a license to do? Like, I mean, does it mean you can be mean or, or like, I, I just don't understand what, like what actually, to what end? I don't even, I don't understand what the message is. Like, it's very. No, it helps nobody. It, 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 helps it doesn't. Nobody. Like, I'm, I'm truly trying to figure out like the future is female. Like what, what actually is the point of that? Who does that help? And as if girls aren't okay. Cause we know that's not actually going to happen. Okay. So how does that help girls learn to deal with men except in a way that is filled with suspicion and filled with anger and anxiety and like a fear of working. I mean, like it doesn't do anybody any good. These, these phrases are stupid one, but they actually do great damage. Um, I feel like I could talk for another hour and I'm sure my wonderful producer, Tim here is like, it's time. Um, so, um, we do have to wrap up here, but I, I was hoping, you know, I hope you come back on because one thing I'd like to talk about on the next time, the next time you come on, like tomorrow, um, no, I'm kidding, but, uh, <laughs> but, um, but I'd like to talk about, you know, we talked about these situations, like the condition of boys, but a lot of this data is, is on a normal day. And we don't, we're not going to know how, although 
Although I will say there have been some numbers coming in from Fairfax County, which are horrifying. Um, Fs are up by 83% school-wide. Um, uh, for, for kids learning yep. English, Fs are, have risen 100%. The number of Hispanic children who have received Fs um, is 92%. Um, uh, the number of Fs among middle school students is, and that's, that's, not breaking it down by, you know, any demographic race or gender or anything, but is up 300%. I mean, this is grim, 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 grim. And so what I'd like to talk about maybe at a, on a future podcast is, you know, what, how can schools, you know, how can they defend staying closed when we know, you know, there's a lot of people that are struggling. Look, it's not, and you know, when you talk about special needs kids, it's not just boys. There's, there's girls with autism, oh ADD, ADD, ADHD. And so, you know, maybe the next time on the next podcast, we can 100%. talk about just the shutdowns, sort of strictly the shutdowns and how we envision how kids are going to come out of this. Because I, you know, just talking about, you know, what we just talked about and the condition of boys, I really, you know, it makes me think, goodness, goodness what are those numbers going to be like after all of this is over? So I'd like to have you back on to talk about that. This is just a fascinating topic and you are a wonderful guest to, to flesh some of this stuff out. Um, and one quick thing about the schools, I, I think that um, as much as I hate seeing all of these, you know, terrible grades and we know that we're seeing them, you know, pretty much consistently across the country. Yeah. I think it's better to have the grades. Me than too. To what, Providence, what Providence, New York City are doing, which is essentially they have these policies where you can't, right? You know, you can't, you can't fail anybody, and you have to give incompletes, even if you know no work's been done at all, because that's not going to tell right. us anything truth, anything that's truthful. That's so important. So what, what I would say too is I think that it's really important that the, um, that the testing still occur. I think that uh, you know there's lots of pushes, not only coming from the union, but that's one place. You know, they really want to they really want to do away with their annual assessments. And I think that's right. a terrible idea because we've just got to know what we're dealing with and where we are yep. um, in term and in, and in terms of the boys. So far, all I have is anecdotal stuff, which is just that, you know, that boys are disengaging and they're losing track of boys at much higher rates. Yep. That being said, I also have huge concerns about girls because one thing that we know is that. Um, social media has a hugely and much greater impact on girls than boys. It seems to be doing much more damage to girls in terms of levels of anxiety and depression. And I, and I kind of feel like school used to be kind of a break from that, right? Like theoretically, Mm -hmm. they're interacting with peers, they're interacting with teachers, you know, they're not, you know, locked into this social media hellscape. And I, I worry that, for, for, for some girls, you know, there is no break from that for them. So yeah. they may still be keeping up with schoolwork, right? Or they, they may still be engaged, but we don't know what's happening on the emotional side um, for them if they're getting literally no respite from, um, you know, some of that online stuff. So again, kind of, yeah. and kind of to my point, right? Like it's not an us versus them thing. It's, it's, it's looking at where are the, alarm bells going off for all groups and then what can we do best to improve things for them right right um well listen i'm gonna i i right at, you know right after soon after this i'm going to uh try to schedule you to come back on i think this is a really valuable conversation um but it's it's we just scratch, scratch the surface it's all uh, service is all you can do really in a in a podcast, but there's so much more to discuss. And before we sign off, I do, if you can tell people where to hear you, particularly those live Facebook live interviews that you do that I think are so great. Um, just, just if you could tell the audience uh, where to hear your stuff or read your stuff. Sure. So if, if they go to project forever free.org um, I'm the editor of this, of this, platform project forever free and um, it comes from the Frederick Douglass quote once you learn to read you'll be forever free it's it's an education you know the, the main t topic is education on the site and uh, when when you get to the site it says live show and so if you click on live show that gives you all of the um, episodes that I've done um, with all kinds of people and will continue to do. Um, we have not yet gotten those successfully in podcast form. And that has been a, just an issue of um, 
I don't know why we haven't done it yet, but anyway, we've, we've had some problems with some recordings, but the goal was and is to also have a podcast version of those shows because they stream live on Twitter at the time and they stream on Facebook live and then you can go back and watch them anytime, but we don't have them in audio form yet. The other place to find me is um, I'm at E Sanzi on Twitter and I do write the blog Good School Hunting, although I have not been keeping up with it the way that I would like to. Um, so yeah, that's where you can find me. And then we also blame have the Facebook blame, page for blame the kids and the dogs. <laughs> yes, I will gladly. Um, and then I have we have a Facebook page for Project Forever Free as well. If anybody wants to check it out, um, so yeah, that's what that's that's where you can find me. And thanks for having me, Julie. I always love chatting with you. I always love chatting with you too. And it is like talking to a friend. It's so funny. I should tell people that I, I, I do feel like Erica's just such a great friend and, and I enjoy talking to her so much, but we met on Twitter and I've never met her face to face. So we'll have to change that after all this, after we get our shots, after we get our uh, vaccines. I know, so, right. Um, the pandemic I, is making it very difficult to meet people face to face and yes. get on my nerves. <laughs> It is. It is great to have you on. Thank you, Erica. This has been a really um, important conversation and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks everyone for being here for another episode of the Bespoke Parenting Hour. If you enjoyed this episode or like the podcast in general, please leave a rating or review on iTunes. This helps ensure that the podcast reaches as many listeners as possible. If you haven't subscribed to the Bespoke Parenting Hour on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts, please do so so you won't miss an episode. Don't forget to share this episode and let your friends know that they can get bespoke episodes on their favorite podcast app. From all of us here at the Independent Women's Forum, thanks for listening.